the 24th of January 1965, Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill breathed his last. His drinking and eating habits are legendary and he was almost never seen without a cigar. Despite his seemingly hedonistic lifestyle, he lived to the ripe old age of 90 and achieved more in his life than many people can possibly imagine. He was an army officer, a prisoner of war, a journalist, a Nobel Prize winner, an artist, and held almost every major cabinet position, including Prime Minister, twice. He fought in the Boer War and the First World War, and then led the country to victory through the most destructive war in history. To mark his death, I thought I'd take a look at how he lived, what fueled such a life, and what powered the body and mind through so many pivotal moments of history. To that end, I spent a day trying to eat, drink, and smoke like Churchill did throughout his life. Now, every daily routine I looked up had different timings and activities, so I tried to work out a sort of rough average that would seem suitable. You've got to remember, nobody lives their life doing the exact same thing every day. So take this with a pinch of salt. Here's how I got on. This was not my finest hour. My day began at 8am with a good breakfast, tea, juice and of course, whiskey. Churchill would have had servants to do this for him, but I had to get up an hour earlier and do it myself. So the day would begin uh, with Churchill still in bed, breakfast in bed, reading all of the newspapers. You know, keeping up with the uh, current affairs, seeing if there's anything he'd written had been published, anything like that. Giving a really thorough going through. Breakfast also came with the first whiskey and soda of the day. First of many. The first cigar of the day. And you just go through the newspapers, seeing if you could find any of the, uh, the salient points. Good lord, you could have someone's eye out with those. Little known fact, when the wilderness years were written, it was in fact written about my hair. And that's not true. Nine o'clock, so I get second whiskey and soda. There's certainly worse ways to start your morning. So it's now ooh, just after 10 o'clock in the morning. It is time for my third whiskey and soda, a shower, and my second cigar. I will see, and then a walk. Just enough in the bottom of the glass. And then topped up. I don't own a soda siphon, so this will have to do. Okay, you can see how cold the glass is from where I've been sat outside. Churchill would, of course, have smoked while in bed. I do not smoke indoors. Cheers. Okay, I am showered, I am clean, 
washed off some of the cigar smoke. And now it's walkies. So, I'm out for the uh, late morning, mid-morning walk. It's about half past ten. Churchill would have walked around his land at Chartwell, planning gardens, building walls, that sort of thing. I don't have a 26-acre uh, whatever estate. I just have an abandoned railway line. I do feel like I'm slightly dressed for a funeral. But there we go. Going into the tunnel, I need to make my own smoke. Echo! That echoes quite well. So this is cigar number two. It's a Cohiba Siglo, number five, I believe, which I'm reliably informed by, I think it's Cigar Aficionado magazine, is uh, what Gary Oldman smoked during the making of uh, Finest Hour. The... Um, he spent something ridiculous like £50,000 on, according to the interview anyway, £50,000 on uh, cigars for a three or four month period. And uh, yeah, 12 of these a day, which is um, a high average. I've, I've read anywhere up to 15. The usually quoted average is about 10. Uh, my routine, I've factored in about eight. Keep getting funny looks from joggers. So, where was I? Oh yes. So, Alban claims that it cost him 50 quid per cigar. These are about 38 pounds in the UK. So maybe he was converting for dollars, about $50-ish. It may seem um, a lot of this uh, routine is kind of sitting around drinking and smoking, but it does feel you, you do feel quite sort of energetic. You're actually always on the go. Definitely getting funny looks from people going out on their uh, morning jogs. I don't know about you, this is a much better way of um, exercising. So, why am I doing this? Well, at the end of January 1965, Churchill died aged 90, having had a life many of us can only dream of. He, um, I mean, what can you say? He held every cabinet position, senior cabinet position bar one, which I think was foreign secretary, but I might, that's without looking it up. First Lord of the Admiralty twice, army officer, fought in the Boer War, he ended up as a prisoner of war, um, fought in the trenches in World War One. Prime Minister twice, Nobel Prize for Literature, so one of the things we're always told in, um, you know, films of Churchill and things is uh, how little money he actually had. So um, part of the reason I'm doing this, part of the reason I'm doing this is to see how much it costs. A bottle of champagne a day, up to 15 cigars a day. The answer is quite a lot. So then we get the question of, 
who do we think portrayed Churchill the best on screen? Well, Gary Oldman quite rightly uh, won an Oscar for his performance. Um, I wouldn't say he was the best. Obviously heavily made up, and he's a bloody good actor, etc. But um, no, my favourite's always been uh, Albert Finney in the uh, TV film they made, The Gathering Storm. I don't know why they then went with Brendan Gleeson afterwards, but there we go. But yes, Albert Finney, I think, had it best. He, um, he sort of embodied the Churchill. He had the physique, the right sort of age. Actually, he might have been slightly too old for the part he was playing there. Good film if you look it up, by the way. Very young Tom Hiddleston playing his son, uh, Randolph. I did quite like Brian Cox's um, version in uh, Churchill, but um, I don't think he got the voice quite right. One thing I noticed in uh, Gary Oldman's version, if you look closely, he's used a, um, a punch cutter to uh, cut the cigar, which, uh, not a punch cutter, sorry, a V, a v cut which makes a little V-shaped notch in the top. For a start, it would have to be a very small cutter, very small V-cutter to do it to one of these. So I don't think he entirely smoked just these, um, because that wouldn't work. I tried using a punch cutter on this one, it didn't work, so I went with a, a regular cut. Um, but the other reason that the V-cutter wouldn't work for Churchill in real life is because he chewed the cigars uh, quite badly. He wouldn't smoke the whole thing. Quite often it would go out by sort of halfway down. And um, yeah, quite often it would go out by about halfway down. And uh, he'd just chew it the rest of the way. Um, if you do a, a V cut, it cuts into the shoulder which ruins the structure, and after a while it will just fall apart. But the, um, don't worry, the half cigars weren't wasted. They were quite often uh, collected up by the maids, the servants, and given to one of the gardeners, who would uh, cut up the remainder and put it in his pipe. Very expensive tobacco. Been talking so long, bloody thing's gone out. I need both hands for this. So, question is, was Churchill ever actually drunk? He drank a lot, smoked a lot, had various health problems, but he still lived to be 90, which is better than uh, most of us. Obviously he had access to the best health care at the time. He was never actually drunk, or very rarely ever drunk. Um, Full of energy, constantly sort of moving, thinking, doing, um, very long hours. A few years ago I read the uh, autobiography of his, one of his bodyguards, who I want to say was called Walter Thompson, but I've forgotten that, I've had a brain fart. And uh, Thompson at least once um, fell asleep while standing up, trying to keep up with a man that was... Um, Older than him, by quite a lot. Thompson actually tried retiring. Um, he'd been a bodyguard for Churchill between the wars, and uh, Walter uh, Thompson had retired. And I think was running a grocery store, something along those lines, and uh, Churchill called him out of retirement, asking for him specifically to be a bodyguard. And he thought that was Thompson thought that was very strange because. In the early days, they didn't get on. Um, it's a bad idea to film this, walking away from the sun. Keep you in the reflection off the screen. So, 
so um, yeah, it got so bad in the end. Thompson spent so much time with him um, that his marriage fell apart. And uh, he remarried. He married one of Churchill's secretaries. If they'd spent so much time together, that sort of thing will happen. It's a good documentary, actually. I think it's all in black and white. But uh, they did do a TV series, I think simply called Churchill's Bodyguard. Very good series. Oh yes, before I forget, going back to the, uh, the whole V-cut, punch cut, standard cut. One source I read is that um, Churchill used, you have to use quite long matches. If you're going to use a match, if you're going to use a match, you have to use quite a long match to light a cigar. Um, and what he would do is poke a hole in the back of the cigar with the match and smoke it that way. That way you keep all of the shoulder intact and it doesn't fall apart so much. That's the theory anyway. But uh, yes, there we go. Useless, useless piece of information. <laughs> So I'm back from my walk. It is getting on for 12 o'clock, so it's nearly lunchtime. Now, uh, first casualty of the day, I wondered how uh, eating, drinking and smoking like Churchill would um, feel. And uh, first casualty of the day, the shoes I was wearing on the walk, uh, I, I have worn them several times before, but for whatever reason they were rubbing. I was in uh, quite a bit of pain walking back. So the walk was perhaps shorter than planned. Anyway, took off the shoes, and there's what looks like a brown mark on the back of the uh, Achilles tendon. And I thought, oh, maybe I did I drop, you know, an end of a cigar and it went down the back of the shoe and burnt the sock or something. Nope. It is, in fact, blood. And it's the same on the other foot. The things I do for science. Still, nothing that a uh, another whiskey and soda can't fix. Oh. So this is dinner. It's a uh, well, I call it a quiche, but they call it a flan, which uh, actually came from the Churchill cookbook. It's uh, bacon and mushroom. It's very large. And I should have got a bigger plate. That's about half of it on there. And of course with lunch comes the champagne. Get it in focus. Paul Roger was uh, Churchill's favourite. So let's see what it's like. So Churchill would get through at least a bottle of this, but the bottles were smaller, they were imperial pint sized bottles. One account I read said that he drank it out of a silver tankard. So I've seen other people do the, um, 
you know, trying to drink like Churchill challenge. I haven't seen anybody do, try and do the drink and smoke and eat. Um, there was a guy that did it, matching drink, Churchill drink for drink, uh, did it for the Telegraph, um, the newspaper. And uh, one thing he didn't do was eat enough, I don't think. Um, lots of food soaks up lots of the alcohol. Uh, that's not a mistake I intend to make. Cheers. <sighs> Champagne for lunch and whiskey and soda for the rest of the day. A little bit windy. Anyway, it is coming up to one o'clock. Uh, I finished lunch. I'm just finishing the last of my uh, portion of champagne. And it's coming on to cigar number three. This is an Upman number two. It's a Pyramida, for obvious reasons. Um, useless fact about Upman. Um, I was an interview years ago. One of the guys who'd been a prisoner of war in Colditz. Uh, one of them had been sent some cigars that were Upman brand. And quite often cigars come in a, uh, a metal tube. This one didn't, but uh, sometimes they come in a metal tube. And um, Upman gave the prisoners an idea for where to hide their doc you know, forged documents. <whistles> yeah. So after lunch, once I finish the champagne, after lunch comes the cognac. Hein, I've read, was a particular favourite. So I'm going to have some. fingers. I haven't got a proper brandy glass, so this is the next best thing. Mm. This is science. So this is the point where it all started to go a bit wrong. Okay, so... <clears throat> Um, it's now just after three o'clock. Um, I should be lighting up my fourth cigar of the day. Um, uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, yeah, I was fine until about half past two. Um, so a pint of champagne is about... It's a bit over three glasses. Three of the normal sort of flute-sized glasses. Hang on. Oh, I'll go and get it. There we go. All right. Okay. So three, just over three glasses of that size is uh, about a pint. And uh, it was just after that glass that it started to kick in. Until then, I was sort of feeling the... The kind of confidence, um, you know, when you're just starting to get under the influence, 
You're quite confident. You still feel like you could drive, but you probably shouldn't. Um, and then, yeah, about half past two, after the third glass, that's when it kicked in. Um, now I would say I am actually drunk. Um, despite eating a lot. Uh, about quarter to three, I got what you could describe as the munchies. So I've just been back and eaten a bit more of the quiche and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, this was a big quiche. It was The dish we cooked it in was 23 centimetres across. And I've eaten most of it. Um, on top of everything else. The cigars, on the other hand, as I say, I should be starting up the fourth one by now. Um... I'm filming this at the end of January. Uh, it's very cold outside. It's about minus two, minus three, that sort of temperature. Um, and yeah, the third one, the Upman, to finish it, felt like a bit of a chore. Um, and I just started to get a bit of a headache. Which is better than I thought I would do. Granted, I haven't smoked them all down as far as I would normally. Um, but then, you know, Churchill only smoked them halfway down. So what I thought I'd do is I'd talk you through the remainder. Oh, excuse me. The remainder of the um, cigars I have left, and why I chose them. Um, I am now on my fifth. I think this is the fifth whiskey and soda. This was okay, actually. This wasn't too bad, because it's very watered down. It's mostly soda water. Um, so I've been weeing a lot. And um, the champagne made me burp a lot. Anyway, so... I think I'm possibly slightly more drunk than I feel. But anyway... So... Um, the mid 1890s Churchill went to Cuba and uh, that's where the love of cigars started so all the cigars I picked for this challenge today which I failed by the way uh, were Cubans they've all got Habana and that sort of thing written on the uh, on the labels um, I've had three uh, yeah, that's as far as I'm going today, I think. I'm, I probably could manage... I could probably manage two or three more. I might have another one later. Um, but, yeah, this is... Uh, it's very cold outside. And I'm not enjoying them anymore. Um, normally, you know, I smoke a cigar to enjoy it. Maybe once a week. Uh, I tend to smoke a pipe the rest of the time. But anyway... So, I picked uh, cigars I, I picked for this challenge. You've got the Monte Cristo. I forget which one this is. It might be... It's either the one or the three, because that's... There's two of them. Um, this one, the longer of the two, which I will put the name of on the screen here when I get around to editing this. Um, Monte Cristo was Roger Moore's favourite. The um, the Bond actor. James Bond smokes his own um, specially blended cigars. Uh, sorry, cigarettes. Um, but Roger Moore, that's in the book. Roger Moore uh, was a cigar fan. And um, uh, his Bond smoked cigars. His first film, Live and Let Die. This is the cigar that he used. I think it's the number one, if I remember quite a lot to drink um this is the one that he uses uh with his hairspray to turn into a flamethrower to kill a snake that someone's put in the room to kill him so that's why i picked that one i think this is the number three i could be wrong it could be the other way around um this is what he is smoking in octopusy when he's in i think the hang glider and also when oh, excuse me He's got some guy standing on his shoulders looking over a wall. That's what he's smoking. They, they sort of 
cut down to smaller ones because they thought that that was a bit too long, a bit too comedically long for the camera. There's a myth that he had it written into his contract that he had to have a lot of cigars on set, as many as he could smoke kind of thing. Um, he den denied it later on. Um, the most important one, and I was hoping to get to this today, uh, was this one, which is, if the camera was, there we go. It's a Romeo and Julieta uh, Cuban in the Churchill size. This was Churchill's favourite brand of cigar. Um, so it's seven inches long by, I believe, 47 ring gauge. Um, this is it. it, it the, uh, Churchill cigar is a certain size of cigar, but if any cigar can claim to be a proper Churchill, this is it. So it even says Churchill on the band. Um, I have had a Romeo and Julieta cigar before, um, but not the Churchill size. I had a smaller one, about five, five and a half inch, that sort of size. Um, I was hoping to get to this. I may get to this later. If I decide to have another cigar later, I will have this one. Um, two others. So we've got the Diplomaticos, Diplomaticos Habana. We go to another Pyramida. I've had the Upman Pyramida. Um, this is almost identical size in both uh, ring gauge and length. And then Hoyo de Monterey. Again, a Habana, so they're all Cuban. Uh, this is bigger than a Churchill. Um, let's line up the bases of them. There you go. So the Churchill is this one, and there's the Hoyo de Monterey. Um, but yes, I'm actually, I, I did better than I thought I would with the cigars. I normally only have one or so a week. Um, but yeah, it's really cold outside, so I've come inside. I wouldn't smoke indoors anyway even if I was allowed to, um, because it just stinks the place out. I haven't been to Chartwell yet, so I would like to go to Chartwell and see what it smells like. I bet it still smell, smells of cigar smoke. Um, but yes, I've had three. I'll put a picture on screen of how far I got with the three. Um, I may have another one later. I might go as far as two. But um, yes, three o'clock, I was due to start up my fourth cigar, and uh, I'm not going to, I'm afraid. Sorry. Cheers. I'm also really tired. Um, here's a mess, because I've had a hat on. Um, yeah. It does... Drinking that much alcohol in, in a day does give you a kind of almost a manic kind of energy um, I'm also talking <laughs> slightly as if I've got a blocked nose um, which again I put down to the cigars uh, to get the most flavour out of a cigar you breathe the smoke out through your nose you don't breathe in a cigar anyway um, you can you're not supposed to um, but yeah, you can breathe. To get the most flavours, you breathe it out through your nose. And uh, I smoke a pipe most of the time. And I breathe that out through my nose a lot of the time. And um, yeah, you do end up with a bit of a sort of a <coughs> noise going on. Because you end up with like a... It's, it's not very pleasant. It's back of the nose kind of yuck. Um, if you ever watch... There was a series a few years ago where Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon uh, were doing like impressions of people and they both do an impression of Michael Caine and Michael Caine is a big cigar lover and <laughs> as they put it all the cigars and the brandy sounds like you've got a very blocked nose um, it's that kind of thing I think that's sort of what 
lent uh, the way Churchill spoke. Um, you know, up to fifteen cigars a day, every day. That's going to have an effect on your um, <clears throat> on your speech. He had a speech impediment, impediment anyway. <laughs> that was before the alcohol and the cigars. Um, so price wise, regards to cigars, I chose the ones I did because they're all Cuban, which was his his go to. Um, he wrote. <laughs> he wrote a there's a famous he wrote a letter to a hmm, to uh JJ they're now called JJ Fox. The shop is still there in London and um in their basement they've got uh a pack a box of cigars that Churchill bought but never got around to smoking and they've got um a ledger with the orders in, the accounts book with his orders in. Um that he ordered at the time. And there's a story about him ordering some for is it a son-in-law or a grandson. <sighs> I can't remember. I had quite a lot to drink. Um, anyway, he said, you know, a, a box. Uh, give me a box of good cigars, but not as good as the Romeo and Julieta. Um, because <laughs> that's what he considered the best. So price wise, this is about twenty seven pounds, which is between I'm guessing between thirty five and forty American dollars. Um, some of the cigars I've had were more expensive. The Trinidad Fundadores I had this morning, that's pushing thirty. I will put the um, prices on screen at this point. Um, but yeah, so they're all about the sort of twenty-five pounds sort of area, um, and you're looking at about. I mean, I had eight. I've got eight. I was hoping to get through. I'm not going to do. I'm not going to manage that. Um, but some are more than that. Some are less. I think the cheapest one is that one, which is the Monte Cristo. One, two, no, not two. It's either one or three. Um, which is, I think, 18, 19 pounds. That's the cheapest one. The Fundadoras might be the most expensive. That's sort of 33, 35 pounds, something in that region. So, yes, there you go. This has been a ramble to camera for a quarter of an hour. Um, at four o'clock, I'm due to have a nap. I could quite, I could actually do with it right now. But there we go. I shall soldier on until four o'clock. Yeah. See you then. Bye. So, <clears throat> another thing Churchill picked up in Cuba was the uh, midday, mid-afternoon siesta. So it's now four o'clock in the afternoon and I'm going to bed for an hour or so. And I feel like I need it. See you in an hour. Or thereabouts. Okay, so it's half past five in the afternoon, the evening. It's dark already, anyway. Um, nap wasn't exactly... Um, it was very much needed. I was extremely tired. I was still awake when the wife got home. Sorry, still asleep when the wife got home. Um beginnings of a headache but um mix whiskey and soda and um i'm going to keep this going and see how long i can keep going wish me luck from this point on this becomes more of a radio program my schedule should have been as follows 4 p.m sleep 5 p.m uh, up washed dressed whiskey and soda number six and cigar number five 6pm was dinner with a glass or two of claret. 7pm was a sherry and cigar number 6. 8pm cigar number 7 and more cognac. 10pm was finished champagne, have cigar number 8 and continue working until around 2 o'clock in the morning, which was supposed to be bed. What actually happened was I woke up around 5.30, put my dressing gown on, had a whiskey and soda 
Number six, then sat down to dinner with the wife. Venison stew accompanied by a glass of claret. At 7pm I had the glass of sherry. Eight o'clock I managed a glass of cognac. And at 10pm I finished off the champagne. Instead of working, I fell asleep slash passed out around about 11.30. I woke up the following morning still slightly drunk, but not hungover. By the end of the day I had consumed six whiskey and sodas, three cigars, two glasses of cognac, one glass of claret, one glass of sherry and one bottle of champagne. The cigars cost a total of £208.42p, the newspapers were £10.50 and the alcohol cost £120, leaving me a total of £338.92p. That's before you add the cost of paying servants every day and along with other bills. I haven't included the cost of the food because a lot of it would have come from his own land, so the cost is difficult to calculate. To conclude then, trying to live like Churchill for the day left me feeling tired, drunk and skint. Good night. (laughs) 